Now, as we get started today, um, I just got a quick question as we get moving out. Actually, I got a bunch of things I'm going to talk about. How many of you were able to make it to my State of the Church address a few weeks ago between the services? Yeah, that's what I thought. There is a handful. There's a good chunk of us. They just re- reminding us again, because uh, many of them had missed that opportunity, that when we talked, when I shared in that time, uh, I shared about the, the, fact, the fact that we were blessed to have a, an endowment fund within our church. And it's a beautiful thing, and, and that helps us pay for a lot of church uh, issues that take place, especially for the building. But um, a part of that fund we'd been using for startup ministries and, and uh, church operations and a few things. And that, that part of the fund has, has dwindled down. And that's what we talked about, that state of the church of, of how we can give more and hopefully build that back up. And, and because we'd been taking part of that money from uh, that, that part of the endowment fund, we really were living, working on a, a deficit budget. And so I talked about ways if we all just gave $10 a week more, how it would t- take care of that deficit and give us all kinds of money to go and bless uh, our community and our neighborhood. And so uh, I'm throwing that out there again for us today, that um, those $10 a week, and then I gave all kinds of great opportunities and ways that we can figure out how to, to save $10 a week, like a, you know, a cup or two less of coffee at Starbucks, and that saves you $10 a week, or, or uh, bringing your lunch, brown bagging it to work, or unsubscribing to things you didn't need to be a part of. And, and you know, there were just so many different ways we had talked about those things of how we can help. And, and so that's the goal, that uh, we would get to that point. But here's where we're going to begin. Here's our sermon reading today. As we finish this whole sermon series on money matters, here's what Paul says. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, we have kindled that we we have kindled in you. See to it that you also excel in this grace of giving. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In all of our lives, every aspect of our lives, that we excel in this grace of giving and of pouring ourselves out for others. And that's going to be an important thing. So uh, if you throw my, uh, there we go. And I also want to promote today the new sermon series coming up. Woo, everybody excited? Mm. So, so the new sermon series is going to be the I Am Statements of Jesus. And truly, it's Jesus' invitation to know him. So if you have friends or family or neighbors or someone you say, I don't know that they really know much about God or Jesus or any of that stuff, it would be a great time to invite them in and say, this is a time where we're going to look at some of these statements. And Jesus says, get to know me. And this is how you do know me. And, and it's, it's just going to be a wonderful time, hopefully, as I'm putting this together. So, so work with me as we do this on this uh, invitation, the I Am Statements of Jesus. So here we go. We get into it. Our money matters, excelling in the grace of giving. And so this morning I thought, well, since we're talking about giving, and, and that always you know, sometimes can bring up some interesting attitudes in, within the church, I said, let's start out with something fun and light and easy. So I said, here's some things. Statements, I guess you would say, that you rarely ever hear in church, okay? And, and the first one I thought was perfect. It's, hey, it's my turn to sit in the front pew. You have to move backwards, right? How many times have you ever heard that in the church? Not too often. I like this one. I was so enthralled, Pastor, with your sermon, I didn't even realize that it went 30 minutes over time. <laughs> I've never heard that before, ever. Uh, Personally, I find witnessing much more enjoyable than my golf, and, and I never heard that one before either. Uh, I was thinking some of the other ones. Oh, uh, Pastor, it was so refreshing to sit through a service where the temperature was 60 degrees in the, in the sanctuary. That was awesome. I never heard that before. And it's always amazing because we'll sit down and we'll have a service, and one person will come up and they'll say, Pastor, it was way too hot in there today. And the next person will come up and say, Pastor, it was way too cold in here today. And I go, well, what do you do? You know, you just set a temperature and you run with it. Um, Ooh, another great one. Pastor, I just love it when we sing songs that I've never heard before. <laughs> hey, since we're all here, let's start the service early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody's thinking, wait a minute, that's too close to home. No, no. And, and probably the last one I'll throw out here is, is, nothing inspires me and strengthens my commitment more than our annual stewardship campaign and talks about money. See, that just enthralls me, right? Maybe not. But today is a good day. Today's a great day. It's a chance to celebrate God's blessing in our lives because we've been looking at what it means to truly live and what life is all about. And it's about living generously. 
True story of a, a woman who had sent this letter in, and, and her father had passed away and left a large sum of money to a Christian-based uh, thing. And, and she said, here's why. She says, my father died on Thanksgiving Day. And she said, it's very fitting because my father won a great spiritual battle at Thanksgiving many, many years ago. During the Great Depression, she says, I remember growing up, and my father had saved and saved and saved until he finally saved $5 to buy a new pair of work shoes. And he was so thankful for it. And he went to church, and, and as he sat in church, the preacher was talking about this missionary uh, giving and a chance to give to missions. And, and God said to him, I want you to give that $5 to missions. And he said, I can't. I, I, I've worked so hard. To, to, my shoes, they have holes in them. I have to literally put cardboard in the bottom of my shoes to keep my feet dry. And God says, I want you to give $5, your $5 to the mission. And as she put it, it was so beautiful. She said, and, and of course, must have been from down south because she called him my daddy. <laughs> she said, my daddy, his love and his obedience for Jesus won out, and he gave that $5. She says, it was right after that we were driving to my aunt and uncle's house out in a farm, and we were driving down the road. No one else was around, and there was something in the middle of the road, and so my daddy stopped. He went out and looked, and right there in the middle of the road, a brand new pair of work shoes, size 12, his size. See, God knows how to take care of us. And that, that lady learned as a little girl that God knows how to take care of you. You can trust God in your obedience and your faith and your love. Now, it, I grew up in a family of seven. It was a pretty large family, and, and there was a certain time, uh, you know, it was no fault of, of my father's at this time, but there was a long stretch where we were, uh, he was without a job, and we, we, were, we were poor. Can we say that? I, I was poor, okay? I know what it's like to have food stamps and try and work with them. I know what it's like to go to school and have free lunches. Now, today, everything's digital, you know, and no one knows who pays for what for lunch and all that good stuff, but back then, it was all cash transactions, you know what it was? So I had to carry around this card, and it was always a bright colored card. Why? I have no idea, so everybody would see it, I guess. And I had to carry around this card, so then it came time for me to pay for lunch, I had to pull this large sign up that said, I'm poor! And I'd wave it around, and everybody's go, oh, he can't pay for his lunch, and then I'd tuck it back in my pocket, and now I could go. It probably wasn't quite that dramatic, but it felt like it maybe at times. I understand what it's like to grow up and not have much. But you see, my parents always, in the midst of that, tithed, and they were generous in their giving. And I learned as a young boy that God will take care of you. And God always did. Always. Always. Took care of us. I learned, like this Bible says, Yahweh Yaira, my provider. You know, Abraham proclaimed this name of God on Mount Moriah when the Lord provided a ram for sacrifice. Now, when Kathy and I first got married, the first, one of the first things we decided is that we were going to tithe no matter what. And, and of course, she was working at, at different jobs, and, and I was called in the ministry. I knew it, and so I was working at Youth for Christ. Anybody know Youth for Christ back then? And in Youth for Christ, you made, you know, you, you earned your own money. You went out and got pledges. And, and so if you didn't get enough pledges, guess what? You didn't get paychecks so much. So, so I was poor again, and I was used to it, so it was okay. And, and Kathy and I, in fact, we were so bad. It was, we're so thankful. Her, her stepfather was a deer hunter, and he was very, he's very good at deer hunting. And, and we got to live for months on venison. And anybody here like venison? You know, venison's okay until you have it every meal. It's okay until you have it for venison burgers and venison spaghetti and venison meatloaf, venison, you know, venison pancakes, and pretty soon it was venison everything because it's all we had, and we lived on it. It wasn't so great after that. Kathy and I would sit down and look at the bills. we go, here's our bills, and, and here's you know, what we owe and what we have, and we can't pay our bills. And literally, we would start laughing. And she'd go, okay, God, what are you going to do this month to get it taken care of? And every time, God took care of it. Why? We tried to be as faithful as we could, and God took care of us every time. See, I think we've been blessed with a purpose. See, we've been looking at these godly principles for living. Yeah, we've been talking about our finances and our wealth. It's trying to help us be financially secure. I want to help people be free from the burden of debt. I want to help people live generously, but it's, all, it's about all of life. It's about everything that we have that God has given us as we live generously with it. See, stewardship is really about our spiritual lives. God blesses us that his resources move through us. They meet our family's needs. They meet the others' needs. They meet God's needs within God's mission and purpose. You know, Matthew 10, 8 says this, Freely you have received, freely give. 
a perpetual cycle of what God wants from us. Last week, Luke 6, 38 said this, Give and it will be given back to you, shaken down, pressed together, falling over into your lap. If you remember that, God says, Give and I will give back in the midst of it. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. God is a giver. And God has called us, I truly believe, to grow in the grace of giving in every aspect of our lives. We're called to be givers just like God. And I believe that God wants us to grow in this grace of giving. And he wants to make, for us, it, it, I think God wants to make it a lifestyle, not simply an act that we carry out every once in a while. See, teaching us to give and share is not God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising children. That's who we are, who we're called to be. Because God knows what the true life is, and a true life is about giving and sharing and focusing outside of oneself and living generously in every aspect. And I believe if we fully adopt God's view of wealth and giving, God's going to meet our needs and give us a promise of provision. I have no doubt about God's provision. I have no doubt about God's uh, divine math and how God puts things together for us. I mean, it was Anne Frank who said, no one has ever become poor by giving, and I truly believe that but to be rich in true life. So today, as we go through this, yes, we've been talking about money, but I'm talking about our lives, okay? Every aspect. Are you ready for this? Here's the truth. We have to risk trusting God with what we have, where we are, and who we are. See, this is why it's our, our stewardship is really an act of worship and an act of sacrifice to God, our living generously. God's entrusted us with life, gifts, talents, time, material things, wealth, opportunities, the very lives that we lead. Would you be willing to risk? Would you be willing to maximize that investment God has made within your life? Would you be willing to give and offer back to God more than you ever thought that you could of all that your life is? And I'm not being flippant here because I truly believe that this is a life-changing decision to live generously with your life in every aspect as God's called us to. To reflect God's nature and continue to, to grow and excel in this grace of giving. So here's where we begin. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Here's the context of the scenario. There's, there's been some issues that have taken place, and they're taking up an offering to help meet needs and to carry out God's purpose and mission. So Paul encourages them in chapter 8, verse 7. This is our scripture. You excel in so many things, your faith, your speech, your knowledge, your earnestness, your very love. Now it's time to excel in this grace of giving and all that you are. Excel in the grace of giving. It's a godly principle that will reap great benefits in the very verses behind this, Paul says, I know your hearts. I know you want to give and you want to share. And I, I guess I feel the same way. I look out and I say, I know your hearts. Everybody who's here, you want to give, you want to share, you want to live generously because you know that's what we're called to do. And Paul, he literally in the midst of it says this. This is in verse 11. He says, now is the time to finish that work, to bring it to completion. You know, now is a great time. Always. Now is a great time, isn't it? The scripture's full of saying, today is the day. If you hear God's voice, today is the day. Today is the day. Now is the time to make things happen. And it's encouragement, because Paul is saying, take this passion that you have, the good intentions of your heart, and turn it into a reality. But like all things in life, it's so much easier to talk about it, to think about it, to plan about it, than it is to actually do it, right? Right? There's always a thousand reasons, a thousand excuses. Oh, you know, it's just not the right timing. Maybe when the economy turns, when the kids get older, when I get out of school, when this gets paid off, when that happens, when this, you know, we've always got these, all these excuses. And I think what Paul is saying, now, now is the time. Can you just risk trusting God with what you have, where you are, and who you are, and give yourself completely to God? See, the example that he gives is really back in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, the five verses right before the verse that we talk about. 
And he's talking about these Macedonian churches, these churches in Macedonia. And he says they, have, they live in extreme poverty. And in their extreme poverty, they gave beyond their ability. In fact, they begged for us the privilege to be able to share and to give and to help. You see, they didn't give out an abundance. They gave out a sacrifice. They gave out of their poverty. So it's not about amounts, right? Remember we talked about that. Not about amounts. It's about a heart of sacrifice and giving and obedience and offering that to God. Let me tell you, I'm going to read you a little story. I like this story. This is a good one. It's called The 57 Cents That Changed and Made History. You ready? Story starts like this. There's a, and this is a true story. A sobbing little girl stood outside a small church from which she had been turned away because it was too crowded. And she was crying, saying, I can't go to Sunday school. And she sobbed as to the pastor as she walked by. And the pastor looked down and saw her shabby, unkept appearance. And the pastor guessed the reason why she was not allowed in. But taking her by the hand, he took her inside. He found a place for her in the Sunday school class. And this child was so touched that she went to bed that night thinking of all the children who had no place to worship Jesus, no place to go to school and, and learn about who Jesus was. Some two years later, this little girl lied dead in one of the poor tenant buildings. And the parents called this kind-hearted pastor who had befriended their daughter to handle the final arrangements. As this poor little girl's body was being moved, a worn, crumpled purse was found, which seemed to have been rummaged from the trash. And inside of it was found 57 cents and a note scribbled in childish handwriting which read, this is to help build the little church bigger so more children can go to Sunday school. For two years she had saved for this offering of love. And when the pastor tearfully read that note, he knew exactly what he had to do. He carried that note and that cracked little purse up to the pulpit. And he told the story of her unselfish love and devotion. And he literally challenged the people of the church to get busy and to begin to raise funds to make this thing happen. But it didn't end there. A newspaper learned of the story and they published it. And it was read by a realtor who offered them a huge parcel of land worth many thousands and thousands of dollars, which they couldn't pay for. And when he was told that the church could not pay for it, he offered it to them for 57 cents. And they bought it. Church members began to give. They began to share. Checks began to come in. And if in five years, this little girl's gift increased to $250,000, an incredibly huge sum because it was at the turn of the century. It was back at 1900. And her unselfish love paid large dividends. So if you ever find yourself in the city of Philadelphia, look up Temple Baptist Church with a seating capacity of 3,300 people. Look up Temple University, where hundreds of students are trained. Look up Good Samaritan Hospital. Look up this Sunday school building, which is there, which houses hundreds of people, so that no child will ever be turned away to come find out who Jesus is. And in one of the rooms of that building, you can find a picture of a sweet little face of a girl who saved 57 cents so sacrificially. She made such a remarkable historical thing happen. Alongside it, you'll find the portrait of the pastor as well because they remembered. It's not about amounts, folks. It's about our giving. It's about living a life truly of generosity. Because Paul goes on in chapter 8 and he says this, when the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has not what one does not have. Whatever you have, whatever God's blessed you with, we give it. So here's the conclusion. The conclusion of the whole message of of, of what Paul's trying to share for us about excelling in the grace of giving. It's in chapter 9, verses 6 through 11, where really, as Paul lays out this godly principle, I think it's a definition of what it means to excel in the grace of giving. And here's what he tells us. He says this, He says, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow generously, what do you reap? Generously. That's just a part of life, folks. We understand that. Each one of you should give as you've decided to give within your heart. And in that decision, I think it's through prayer and discernment, through our thanksgiving, through understanding God's blessing us, his grace in our lives. 
Paul says, don't give in reluctance. Don't give under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver, someone who lives this, this, this life of generosity, someone who excels in this life of giving and this grace of giving. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things and at all times you will have what you need and it will abound, you will be able to abound in every good work. It's a promise of provision. God will give you what you need. You know, in verse 11, it's an amazing thing. God says, I will take care of you so that you can be rich in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through your generosity, God gets the glory. Now, this rich, he says you can be rich in, in all of your life. What does he mean by that? I think he already explained this back in chapter 8. You know the grace of the Lord Jesus, that for your sakes he was rich, and yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He's not talking about finances there, folks. He's talking about a life of giving and pouring yourself out for others. That's what God wants to do for us as we give and as we share. A lifestyle of excelling in the grace of giving. And as, I, as you give, I think God says, I'll return it to you so you can live generously and live and thrive and give and that you can all the more be generous again. I think it's a perpetual cycle that God will give us as long as that flows through us. I'm going to close with this story from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon and George Mueller uh, both lived back in 19th century England. Charles Spurgeon may be one of the most famous pastors, preachers there's ever been. And George Mueller was a thief who turned Christian, and then he founded five orphanages and directed them. Now, once, uh, one time, Spurgeon had worked very hard to collect 300 pounds in donations, which was a lot of money back then, because he urgently needed to help the orphanages that he supported. He had finally collected all 300 of those pounds, and he said he went to bed that night a content person. Anybody ever gone to bed a content person? You finally got it done. Before he could fall asleep, the Lord said, I want you to give those 300 pounds to George Mueller, to his uh, orphanages in Bristol. And he said, but God, I, I work so hard, I can't give this up to them. God said, I want you to give that 300 pounds to George Mueller. And he agreed and said, I will do so. He got up the next morning, started off toward Brits, Bristol, got to George Mueller's house. And as he got there, he said he was literally on his knees praying. And he said, he said George, here, here's what it is. God told me to give you these 300 pounds. He says, oh, my goodness. He says, that is the exact amount I've been praying for right here. Of course, I'm sure they celebrated the fact that God did something wonderful and amazing so Charles Spurgeon leaves, and he's going back home. And when he arrives back home, he said he gets inside his, his house. He goes to his desk, and there on his desk, he says there's an envelope. And inside that envelope is 300 guineas. A guinea is worth one pound and also a shilling with it. He began to celebrate and jump for joy. He said, my goodness, God not only gave me back my 300 pounds, but he gave me 300 shillings as interest on it as well. That God knows how to take care of us. And if we live that life and excel in this grace of giving, God says, I'll make things happen. I'll make things happen.